Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. Let's look into his scriptures and see some of the things that he has set forth 
concerning that. I want to go to the third chapter of Matthew. And we find here one John, John the Baptist has done the messenger of the anointed one as was prophesied of him. He comes forth crying in the wilderness, preaching repentance, repent, turn away from that which you have been following. Turn away from that way which you have been following. Repent of your sins and turn away from that. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, he said. The Lord Jesus himself continued that theme when he began to speak to the people. And he also said, repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. The apostles continued it and said, repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. And he set some examples for us, but let's look at them now in the third chapter of the book of Matthew. And we see John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is in hand. This is he which was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, to make his path straight. Now notice the simplicity that he comes. He doesn't come dressed in the priestly robes of the Pharisees. Though his father was a priest, we find him coming. The same John had a raiment of uh, camel's hair and a leather, leather girdle about his loins, and his feet were close and wild honey. A simple man. John the Baptist had been hidden in the wilderness until the time for him to come forth. We find that immediately after he was born, or soon after he was born, he was carried away into the wilderness. Thereby, he was not in the area where Herod might reach him when he tried to destroy the babes. But he was raised in the wilderness. The Lord Jesus said something about Zacharias rebuking the Pharisees and said that they had killed him between the altar and the temple or something to that thing. So that's the only word that we have. We're not even sure that this is the same Zacharias, but we assume that it was. At any rate, John is raised in the wilderness, and the Spirit of God is his teacher. We find him coming forth at the appropriate proper time, and when we examine God's Word, we find that throughout his Word, these important things that he sets forth that must happen at a particular time, he has prepared them for it. You can start back with the temple and see how that he prepared and gave men skill in order that they could build that thing and never have the sound of a hammer on the side of the temple when they set it up. They cut the stones, they trimmed the woodwork, they laid out the gold and all this, all done because God gave some men the skill to do it. You know, we can hardly do that today with our modern machines and blueprints. We go build something over here, and it's built by blueprint, and it's supposed to fit exactly, but when we take it over here to match it to another part, it don't fit. Believe me, I can guarantee that. God is able, and he did prepare these men to do that. He gave them the engineering skill, and he gave them the, the ability to use their hands and those that worked with them, that they did that. And so John the Baptist is prepared to come forth at the proper time to set forth and declare the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have said that Elias would come. They have looked for that. They still look for Elias to come. Christ said, John the Baptist, if you, if you can see it, he is he. He is the one that has come. He has done and proclaimed it. So then we have to look. We have to rightly divide God's word. So now we're looking here and we see John coming. Everybody went out. They went out from Jerusalem. 
from Judea, from the region round about. And they were baptized in Jordan, confessing their sins. Here he, these people are moved. How, how is it that all these people all of a sudden begin to come out why would they hear a man that was coming out of the wilderness here? An unknown person. I say to you that it was because the Spirit of God was calling them out. The Spirit of God was moving those people that they were seeking the kingdom. And when it was said that here is one that is proclaiming his coming, they were going out to hear about it. First of all, the common people. We do find that some of the Pharisees came out and he rebuked them. We read on here a little bit. He said in the 7th verse, He saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into his baptism. He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Here we see a pattern set forth. Here we see John demanding right candidates. He's demanding people that have been touched by the Spirit of God. They're not coming for the popularity of being in this kingdom. They're not coming because so and so did, but because the Spirit has moved them from within and they're moving out because they are seeking the Spirit has taught them that things are not like they should be. God has taught us over the past few years that things were not like they should be, and He's moved us to step out and move forward and to seek the Lord, and we have found Him. For those that seek the Lord will find Him. And we found Him in places, we will find Him in places that we didn't know He was there. I remember back in few years back, several in fact, I was in the South Pacific, some of you heard me tell this story, and I was seeking the Lord also, and I found him over there. I found him on the high seas. I found him when the seas were so rough that you could not even go out on the decks. When the waves were so great, they would swallow the ship. And I found him when the water was so calm. And I remember the scripture over there where Christ rebuked the, the sea and it became so quiet that there was not a ripple in it. In a moment of time, Christ stilled the sea. And they said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? What manner of man is this? All they could see was the man. They saw a power there, but they did not know who it was. It has to be revealed by the power of the Spirit. So then when we are touched by the Spirit of God, we begin to see that. And we're made to see the kingdom, and we begin to press into it. Then the, this baptism that he sets forth for us is a way in there that we can receive the greater blessing. Because it is an answer to a clear conscience before God that we come into his house, that we join his people, that we unite one with another to sing his praises, to <laughs> preach his word, and to hear him preach. But he would not take these people because they were not fit candidates. They were coming for another purpose. And he told them to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. So then we too, from that time forward, his church has demanded that those who come for membership in it must bring forth fruit meet for repentance. Turn away, turning away from the ways of the world, turning away from that, and reaching for the higher things. And to seek the higher things is that which we have the blessed privilege of. As we study His Word, we're made more able to learn of Him and if we learn of him, we do rise to higher planes. I spoke here on higher planes one time. Bring forth, therefore, meat. Fruit, meat for repentance. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. 
For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Even of the stones. I've heard that spiritualized a whole lot. But I like it just the way it's written. Because God does have that power. Yes, He's able to change these hearts and stony hearts of ours. He's able to do that. But He is also able of the stones to raise up children if He so wished to do. He has that power. If you look at the wisdom of God, think about, if you want to think about that, the utmost in wisdom, think about God in making a man. Somebody mentioned that everything else was created, but man he made with his hands. Scientists have learned that the composition of the human body is exactly the same molecules, the same atoms, that is found in clay. The finest powdered clay. And God, with his wisdom and skill, his power, made Adam from that. That's the God that we serve. One that's able. And he set forth for us the kingdom to walk in. Now also the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cast in the fire. I baptize you with water under repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He who comes after you, he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He says, one place is one walking among you. Giving them the instruction that, yes, even now he walks among you. Evidently, Christ had not seen John, or they had not seen each other, or met in their lifetime. You remember that on the event of Mary's coming to the house where John's mother was, how that John leaped in the womb, how that he glorified Christ in this way, manifesting his faith in Christ right there, even before he's born. I believe that he was in the third month at that time, if we figure it correctly. We find that here is an evidence. We want to know when a baby is a human being. When it's conceived, it is a human being. It's alive. It's living. This one at three months in his pregnancy was able to recognize the power of the Spirit of God when the Savior comes into His presence. How is that? By the power of the Spirit of God that was in Him and which dwells in us. Yes, the Spirit of God dwells in us. That's a wonderful thought. And we're told that when we finish the course here, if we call back to meet Him there, or to meet Him up there, Back to God who gave it. That also is a wonderful thought. Here he says, this one that's coming, pointing to Jesus. He says, this plan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the gardener, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized of him. One of the other gospels said that when John saw him coming, he made this statement. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. That reminds me of Abraham over there when he offered Isaac on Mount Moriah. And he said to Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb for an offering. And when they set up the Passover feast, which was a figure of the crucifixion of Christ, when they set that up over there, you can see the cross of Christ in it all the way through. You can see Christ in it. You can see the lamb. You see that there had to be a lamb prepared. You find that this lamb had to be kept up for ten days and watched. 
And we find Christ on display for this period of time. How that they watched him. And he was proven to be a perfect offering. He had to be a perfect offering to accomplish that which he came to do. The Passover shows for this, shows for the greatness of the purity of Christ, the perfection that was there. And you notice another thing. They didn't break any bones of this lamb that they used in this sacrifice. And it was said of Christ and Isaiah, I believe it is, that not a bone of him shall be broken. All these things are set forth speaking of this Christ, the one whom John is proclaiming that he is greater than I. It's all set forth for their learning and for our learning. When we see the blood on the doorpost on each side, we see the cross of Christ and the bleeding of his hands and the horns in his head. And we can see with a little bit of knowledge of the crucifixion, we can see the picture of Christ there on the cross. <clears throat> then we can see how that he sets forth the linen cloth that's to be used in displaying the purity of our Savior out of the wine which is a figure of his blood is set forth and in the Passover, there is a cup set forth, which is, they call the cup of redemption, which Christ took at the last Passover that was dead, when he established the, what we know as the communion service, the Lord's Supper. He took that cup, and he gave it to them to drink. And he explained it to them what it was. So we see this one that John is proclaiming here. But John forbade him, saying, I have thee to be baptized with thee, comest thou to me? And Jesus answered him, said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. This word suffer troubled me a little bit, and I wanted to find out what it meant. The nearest I could come to in modern day language is permit. Permit it to be so now, John. Jesus was a kind Savior. He was not abusive in his commands, but he gave his commands in such a way that people wanted to obey him. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went straightway up out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now notice the voice from heaven. Somebody's already quoted, won't quote it again. Lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The voice from heaven. We have here the voice of God speaking. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit that come down in the form of the dove that lighted upon him. That was evident to John and to him, and to us who are able to see the picture there, that indeed this was the Christ, the Son of the living God. We have no problem with that because we know, because of his word here, that it was he, and that he has fulfilled, or was walking in the fulfilling of those things concerning him. And looking at the whole picture, we know that he did complete that job. So we see God speaking in that. You go to, to another place where you hear God speaking and you hear him say, of the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. Hear ye him. That's an important thing to us. Somebody mentioned the grave clothes and the coming out. I, I see the same thing there. The grave clothes were not disturbed. Only the napkin that was over his mouth was moved. That was a sign to us again, pointing out what the Lord had said to the apostles, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. So we go on a little bit more with baptism. We go over here and we find some more things that's written about it. We find a whole lot about it in Acts. But I want to go to the second chapter of the 37th verse. 
And we find here that the day of Pentecost being fully come, these things that have happened, we had heard the gospel preached. People from about 14 different nations had been there, and they had heard the apostles in plural, all of them, speaking of, the, of this kingdom, talking of the things that Christ had taught them. And they heard it in their language of their homeland, in the language of the land where they dwell. This sounds like a strange thing, and it has been to people down through the ages. It was a complete mystery. It no longer needs to be a mystery to us. We know we serve a God that's able to do anything. And if he can tell man how to build a machine that'll do that, we know that he can do it without the machine. And that's what he done. He can give these, these men the ability to hear it in the language that they were used to hearing. They didn't have to listen to it in the Hebrew tongue. They heard it in the language that they were used to hearing. That way it come through clearer. And when it was over with, and Peter gave his exhortation to them, when some that were there that didn't hear it, that didn't understand the gospel, there's always some around somewhere that don't. There are men there that said, these men are drunk. And then Peter come forward and he said, these men are not drunk. If you suppose he's going to the third hour of the day, it's too early for men to be drunk. But this is that which is spoken of the prophets. This is that which is spoken of the prophets. And he goes on, and these people then, some 2,000 of them were pricked in their hearts. Here's what we look for. Here's what we look for when one comes seeking a home in the church. Have they been pricked in their heart? Is there evidence that they are seeking to follow after the Lord? Because when the Lord pricks one in the heart, he changes a little bit. He begins to try to seek that something different. If he knows anything about it, if he has had any training at all, then he's going to begin to understand the things that he's heard. The things that have been preached in his hearing, those things that his mother taught him back when he was a child, those things will begin to come back to him. And he will begin to see that indeed there is a Christ. And indeed he is calling. We don't know what, but he's convicting our hearts. They were pricked in their hearts. They said, Ben, brother, what do we do? They had just been told that they had crucified the Lord. Have you been told that you have just crucified the Lord? Well, you have. Amen. We were all guilty. Every one of us was guilty. He had our sins. He bore our sins to the cross. And so we are, are guilty. So then there should be a pricking in the heart. And so these men were pricked in the hearts. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, and they repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now I think the scripture over there in the 17th chapter of John, where the Lord said, I pray not for these only, but for those who will believe, having heard your words. That's us. What a blessing it is that we can find some bit of scripture over there that we can take hold of, that we can feel like, here's a promise to me, that I can take hold of it and be lifted up, that I have a hope. Somebody said, what's hope? Well, our hope is better than the hope that the people of the world has. We hope we'll have enough money to buy a car next year, but we don't think we will. But the hope that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ of heaven and mortal glory is a sure hope because it's anchored within the veil. That anchor chain goes up to the very throne of God. It's not dangling on the floor of the ocean where it might drag around. Anchored in the throne of God. So the hope that's within us is a living hope. 
And so then it, it was a, to press into this kingdom, to take hold of it. Do those things which are commanded us that we do. What happened? These people in the 41st verse, he said, when they, them, they that gladly received his word were baptized the same day they were added to them 3,000 souls. Oh, what a day that must have been. We've had a lot of blessings here as we heard this blessed word of the Lord poured out to us. We've had a lot of blessings in that. But we haven't had any freaking of hearts, evidently. There hasn't been anybody come forth. I know there's a bunch here, at least there is some here, that have felt the freaking but just won't turn loose. I remember years back when I sat back there on the back seat. At first I sat up here on the front seat until the Lord began to work on me and then I went to the back seat. I stayed back there until it got too hot for me back there and I had to turn loose. And what a blessing it has been. What a great blessing it has been. When the time comes for me to go into places of peril, I had the assurance that I served a God that was able to take care of me where I was, regardless of what happened. And he did. He did. I can tell you some, maybe what you might call hair raising stories about that. But let's just settle for this. He did protect me. And he kept me. And he brought me safely back. And while I was out there, I had a communion with him I had never had before. As I told you, a portion of it there about the ship. But I felt his presence so clearly. And I felt that even the ship was in the palm of his hand. And there was nothing that I needed to fear. And I felt his presence so close that I could feel it. And then he sent me someone to worship with me. And I found another one of his little children one Sunday morning. Out on the deck of that ship by, by himself. And we enjoyed the rest of that voyage a little better. And we were able to commune with each other about the greatness of what the Lord had done for us. Of His Word. And see the blessings that He set forth for us. And you know, I found that opportunity right here in the States. In the place where I worked. And I've had God's little children come to me and ask me questions. And I trust that sometimes I was able to help them at least. To tell them something of the greatness of the Lord and point them to some scripture that would answer their questions. That is a blessing that we all, a privilege that we all have. So that we need to study each one of us to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And we are all his servants. They emphasize again that we are bought with a price. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. We sold ourselves into sin. And we had to be redeemed. And so Christ paid for that very dearly with his blood on the cross. And so we are his property. Bought with the price of his blood. And all he requires of us is that we recognize that. And then he's given us this kingdom that we can walk in and shown us how that we can receive the blessings of that kingdom. The interest of that kingdom is to be baptized and to walk in that way. We find then that there was some deacons baptized or ordained over there. And among them deacons, there was a couple of preachers. And one of them went down, and he went down to Samaria, and he preached to a bunch of people there. And a bunch of them heard him. And there was once a sorcerer there, one who was a false teacher. He put that man in his place. He even turned him around. But he delivered the people 
from the error of their way in that place with the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he baptized many of them there. And then we heard the story the other day you were here about him going down into the desert, this strange place for a man to send a preacher for the Lord, send a preacher. But he seemed to that one man. And I am thankful, as the young man said, that yes, he will go to one man where he was, where he is when he needs him. He came to me, and he come to many others. The experience that I heard from World War I. Oh, Brother Nevin, and most of you know him, or a lot of you know him. He was over in India. And he said he looked up at the stars in the sky and he discovered that the same stars were shining up there that he'd seen back in Texas. And he realized that the same God was watching over him there just like he was back in Texas. He is everywhere. And we can find that evidence for those who have lived to tell about it and those who have had the encouragement or the spirit to tell about it that men can hear it. Thousands of cases like that where God has went to individuals wherever they might have been and he's still doing it. Even in the slums of this country, even in the worst places in this country, God has moved his people. He has went to their rescue. He will walk with us out of sin. He will not help us while we're walking in it. He will in no way help us while we're walking in it. So then find the kingdom and come into it. So we find Philip having found this man and preached the gospel to him, showing forth the greatness of the things that Christ has done for us. And the man said, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And they went down into the water, and he was baptized, and he came up out of the water. This signifying the death and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this symbol is. That's what, why you have baptism as a symbol. And we were raised with Christ in baptism. And as we were raised with him in baptism, we shall be raised with him, our bodies shall be raised with him when he comes back and calls us, and our bodies will be reunited with the Spirit when he calls us to meet him in the air. Now that also is a wonderful blessing. It's something that we can learn as we go into this kingdom. We learn it more perfectly, and the blessing is greater when we're learning it and walking in his kingdom with it. So we see these things setting forth for us for our learning, that we can walk with him, that we can find the greatness of his power. Now then, we go to the Apostle Paul, which is also recorded in Acts, and I've chosen to read this portion over here where Paul is telling about it. He is, he's telling his experience to the kings before whom he is being tried for being Christian. Paul was tried. He was, he was brought to court, tried, and finally beheaded for being a Christian. He refused to deny Christ in any way, to save his life or what else. He refused to do that, not even for the honor of being a Roman citizen. Someone made this, this statement here at some place I was the other day that said he was crucified, but Paul being a Roman was beheaded because he was a Roman. He got some special treatment. The Romans would not crucify a Roman, but they would cut their heads off. They didn't mind doing that a bit. And they didn't mind crucifying the Apostle Peter upside down. And he said he wasn't worthy to be crucified as his master was. So they just obliged him by turning him upside down. Really, they did him a favor. Because he would die quicker that way. But we see how that God works. We see how that God's people 
And we could go on and on and on and see people down from that time until now who have been willing to give their lives for the cause of Christ. Having been baptized into his kingdom, having went through the symbol of baptism, whether it was in his kingdom or whether it was in some other organization, they have died even to this very day. But we find that the reason why we demand baptism from everyone that comes to us from any other than Primitive Baptist is because there's so many people out there that we just go out and start a church and teach anything and baptize under any name. And so, as we look back in the history of our church, we find that they have always baptized or rebaptized those that can't do them. You can go back there in, in the, during the dark ages and you can find that they baptized everybody that comes to their church regardless of where they come from. So we see how sacred, how important they felt the, having the right baptism was to them. How important it is. And it's still important to us that we keep this. That we keep this ordinance as it was given to us. Those who bring forth fruit meet for repentance. That show an evidence that they have turned away from the things of, of this life and who are reaching out to walk more perfectly with the Lord, that they might find His presence, that they might feel His presence, and that they might live in His kingdom according to the way that the Scripture sets forth that we should. And in so doing, there is a greater blessing. There is a greater blessing. I baptized a man one time who had been baptized before, and when he came out of the water, he said, This is the real thing. If the Spirit showed him something there that he had not seen before. This is the real thing. He had been living in He'd been living according to the dictates of the organization that he was in. But it wasn't, there was something that bothered him in his heart. There was something that troubled him. And he saw that they were not teaching the greatness of the majesty of the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw that they were not doing that where he was. They were claiming some of the credit for their eternal salvation in their practices, in their action. Though when they are cornered on it, they will deny that. Because they have not been able to see the perfection that there is in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in following all the way there is a greater blessing so he said this is the real thing so we see that the apostle Paul having been a Pharisee having been walking underneath it under the name of Paul then the, the great one and he became Paul the little one when the Lord met him on the road to Damascus, he had been going about to destroy this Christian movement. He had been going about to destroy it. Christ met him there on the road to Damascus and he turned him around. The repentance means turning around, turning away from the dead works of the law if you're trying to follow the law. Or turning away from the sins of the world or trying to follow humanism. Whatever it is you might be following, turning away from that and depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And know that it is only through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we will have salvation, either here or eternally. Now then there's some action that we do that we can get the blessing and some salvation. There's lots of different kinds of salvation. If you look up the word saved and saving and salvation, you'll find many things there. It doesn't always apply to the eternal salvation. So we can find there is a saving from many things that we walk in this kingdom here in this world. And when we come forth and we take up our cross and we 
go down into the water and are baptized, it gives an answer. It clears our conscience for the pricking of the heart that's been in there telling us we should do it. But I was made for two or three years before I did. But it was a great blessing. Someone has said who stayed out of the church for 50 years or more. Why didn't I do it 50 years ago, he said. Why didn't I do it? Oh, if I had no other pleasure. I could have been walking with God's people in this kingdom for all this time. And I have failed to do so. And I have missed the blessings. There has been more than one that has made that statement, that confession to those that have baptized them. But we find that when Paul sent, led away from the place where Christ met him blind, and he went to a place where Christ sent him, and he was in prayer, and Christ sent a minister to him, and he said unto him, now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. So we need to be calling upon the name of the Lord. When we come to Him, the act of coming to the church and presenting oneself as a member or for membership in that church is evidence of the working of the Spirit within us. And their testimony is <coughs> that they love the Lord. The eunuch's testimony was, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We have to believe that. We have to believe that before we will want to join. And when we believe that, and we say, what shall we do? And we hear the voice of Peter, as he said, arise and be baptized. As his servants, as Christ's servants have been slain since that time, arise and be baptized. Come forth and speak. Tell your experience if you have one, if you can. But to display the love that you have for the church. And sometimes, in fact, most of the time, it seems that God's children cannot say very much. They don't feel worthy. And many times they hold back for a long time. I suppose if we really felt worthy, we wouldn't be meet for baptism. But if we feel so unworthy, we don't think the church will even take us try it. Because if you feel that way, most likely there's been some of them watching you and know how you really feel. There's been some of them that have been able to watch you and see the working of the Spirit in you. I've heard the testimony of two or three ministers since I've been on the ground here yesterday and today talking about their experience that someone else knew it a long time before they did that they were called to the ministry. Yes, that's true. God's children are watching us. And we need to be watching. We need to be watching our little ones so that we can encourage them. Not only the children, but everyone that's in the church or visiting the church. Or those that we meet in everyday life. That we can be a good witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are witnesses. We're supposed to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't like that because somebody else uses the term. But if the Bible teaches us what's wrong with it, our life should be a living sign, a candle. Christ said, as candles, you don't light a candle that's hiding under the bed, it seems like we have for a long time. When you light a candle, you put it up here to give men light. And when a group comes together like this, and we have our candles lighted, it shines out to the neighborhood. 
I got a guilty conscience right now. I saw a man across the street. I didn't go over there and invite him over. You know, I wonder sometimes if we take the time to let our neighbors and the people in the community know that we're having an old fashioned Baptist meeting going on and invite them to come over and hear the preaching. We might be surprised. Be surprised at what the Lord can do. He works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. So we see how this is set forth an ordinance, ordinance that we walk therein. I've got to run out of time. But hear the words of Jesus, and then I'll quit with that. In Luke, in the 28th chapter, and here is the way that it's supposed to be done. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now notice this last part. And lo, I am with you all the way. All of the way. He is with us all the way. He has promised. This is a promise to us. It was a promise to the disciples. It was a promise to us that he will be with us when we are walking in this way. When we take up our cross to walk in his kingdom, he will help us. He will help us. We have the witness. Every one of the ministers in here will tell you that he has helped. And most of the most of the congregation will tell you that he has been with us, that he has helped. There might be one or two that haven't recognized it yet. But if you look, he has. He has blessed you. He has helped you. He will continue to help you. So then we have this. We have to have a candidate which is meat, which has brought forth meat, fruit for repentance. We have to have an administrator who is a proper administrator. One who knows and teaches the word of the Lord is ordained in his kingdom and is walking orderly in that kingdom. And then we have to have the proper mode, which is to be buried in baptism, to rise, to walk in newness of life, that we might more perfectly find his presence as we go along. I beg you to look at these things and think about them. If I have said something amiss, tell me. Thank you. Sovereign Grace a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.